It's always fun to reminisce about unique devices released through the years to see how far we've come. In today's case, we're taking a look back at the LG Prada 2. This was a phone that was released in 2008, making it a decade old, and it was an unusual collaboration between the South Korean manufacturer LG and Prada, a fashion brand name. We already saw the original Prada two years prior to the release of this phone, and it was unique for being the first phone in the world to use a capacitive touchscreen, so it even beat the original iPhone in terms of giving you a very sensitive display for touch interaction. Prior to this, most consumer phones, in fact all consumer phones, use resistive screens, which were plasticky, they were difficult to use, they weren't very responsive, and often required you to press down heavily using your nails or to use a stylus. You can think back to the days of Windows Mobile and early PDAs to remember what that experience was like. Of course, anything that's branded by Prada or Armani is going to be expensive, and the original price for this phone was around $900, when even premium devices like the first Apple iPhone often only sold for $600 or $700. So this was definitely more expensive, but LG's argument and Prada's argument is the phone could also be kind of an accessory, it could be a statement, other unique elements for the Prada 2 included a 5 megapixel autofocus camera that was made by Schneider Kruzek, so it was pretty good in terms of optics back in the day. In addition, it had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. In particular, Wi-Fi was a new feature for the Prada 2 since the original lacked this connectivity option. So the box here is very premium looking, it has a fake leather build, so a very unusual looking box, but kind of expected for something, again, a lot more expensive than a typical phone. We also have the Prada 2 sitting inside right on top. We'll take a closer look at it in a second. Underneath here, we do have probably the various uh, documentations as well as uh, protective accessories, including a real leather case that also came with the original LG Prada, so this is something that they retained. You can see it has the Prada stitching on the very bottom here. This is what it looks like. So definitely a very clever design there. Also protects the phone while remaining its uh, stylish overall appearance. A pretty future forward thinking and design from LG. Uh, just because, again, I think that for the most part, the design still holds up pretty well, even though the only downside is going to be that smaller screen. And obviously, it's not running on a smartphone operating system like Android, so you don't have access to many modern apps, which is a bit of a shame. In here, we also have the syncing cable, which is probably just using micro USB, unless it went with something proprietary. Uh, so indeed, there is a proprietary LG uh, charger, which I haven't seen in many years now. And there is also a separate travel adapter, so that's probably the European-based head. And down below here, we also have earbuds. So this is something that we don't see these days with many phones but uh, it came bundled back in the day, and you had to use an adapter just to plug these in because, again, there was no standard headphone port. So just like on many modern phones, once again, we lost that port. These are also branded by Prada, and on the very bottom of the box, we had access to what looks like uh, the battery, a Prada-branded microfiber cleaning cloth, I'm guessing. Indeed, so you can clean off the display if it gets greasy or dirty, and there's also a mini CD for installing the software on your computer. And it opens up like this, and going back to the phone here, um, again, very similar in terms of design compared to the original LG Prada. Um, so putting them side by side, in fact, you can't really tell a huge difference. So we have the Prada branding on the top. There's also a front-facing camera that was a new feature that you didn't get on the original. So you could take selfies, you could use it for video chatting. There's the earpiece, the aforementioned 3.1-inch capacitive touchscreen display. And down below, we had access to physical keys for talk and end, which serves also as the power key and a home key. On the side here, we do have what looks like a volume rocker. We also have access on the other side to a micro SD card slot, so it's nice that this is hot swappable. You don't have to remove the back cover to access it, and it seems like there's already a card installed. Again, it's probably two gigabytes or so. There's also a lock switch for the touchscreen, a multitasking key, and a dedicated camera shutter key, so definitely a lot of buttons going on. But um, as a whole, they kept consistent with the black and silver theme running across the entire device. It was definitely a pretty thick 
phone just because of the QWERTY keyboard. Um, it is spring assisted and slides out very easily as you can see there. It's a four row layout and makes typing a lot easier. Uh, the keys actually feel pretty tactile and responsive here on first impressions and there's also arrow keys on the bottom here and it's a backlit keyboard of course. Reminds me a little bit of a Sony Ericsson phone now that I'm thinking about it but this is technically an earlier device so in a way I guess Sony reminds me of LG. Not really sure there. On the back here we can remove another tape and we also have access to a tape covering up the 5 megapixel camera with autofocus LED flash and vanity mirror. And incredibly, after sitting in storage for 10 years, there still is a little bit of power left in the battery. So turning things on, we are greeted to the interface, which is all in black and white on purpose, just to match the entire Prada look. And it definitely is a very striking design. Um, in fact, they're using only an IPS TFT LCD display, but it almost reminds me of AMOLED just because of this particular color theme. And it says Prada, there's no SIM card inserted, and we have this LG-inspired interface that I can tap on. There's haptic feedback, so whenever you tap on a key, the entire phone vibrates as if it was a real button, which is pretty cool. It's separated by communications, so I can dial someone, look at contacts, send a message, entertainment, so a gallery, there's a file manager, there's your camera, video camera, there's also a movie studio, um, MP3 music, FM radio, and also games and apps. So if we try tapping on games and apps, we should find a selection of Java-based programs such as Flying Dices. Um, so this is using the accelerometer. Very similar to other LG phones that we've seen uh, in the past where you would simply shake the, the phone in order to access the accelerometer and then randomly throw two dice. So this could be you know, helpful if you don't have physical dice available. A pretty interesting interface. And there's even other things that you can do with this, including other games like card-based games that you can play around with if you tap on the various edges. And there's also down below here access to utilities. So the web browser, as well as the alarms, organizer, memo pad, a voice recorder, as well as other tools like a calculator, stopwatch, converter. And again, the entire interface is in black and white. So it is pretty consistent. Uh, and it does look actually pretty elegant. A touchscreen capacitive, again, is fairly sensitive uh, even now. And there's also access to, again, settings. So you can turn on Wi-Fi, you can change the uh, screen settings, things like that. If we slide out the QWERTY keyboard here, the screen will automatically flip itself, as you can see there, even though it does have an accelerometer by itself. And this makes it slightly easier to tap on these controls. And if I go back, it also changes the interface to pop up this carousel view of uh, tasks that you would want to use a keyboard for, including accessing the browser to type something in, including uh, writing an email, a to-do list, or a memo. So this all takes advantage of this layout. And again, the backlit keyboard is in silver as well as in red, which matches the overall kind of Prada look. It actually still feels, again, pretty easy to use. Uh, there's actually three panels, it seems like, on this interface, whereas on the original Prada, we only got one page. So this is very similar to LG's S-Class interface that they built onto more and more of their later phones before switching over to Android. So there's a widget for a clock, for instance, I can tap on to set an alarm, and I can probably also long hold to drag it around the display, as you can see there. A little bit of lag, but it's uh, possible. And tapping on settings here, there's also other widgets that you have access to. Now there's not a very wide selection just because you can't download and add new widgets from what's already built on in, but at least you do have a few selections on here. So for instance, if I want to use the memo pad, I can drag that over and you can see it occupies an area of the space. I can tap on OK, and if I tap on this, it will give me a full uh, space for the memo. I can also hide it by dragging it back in. There's also a feature called shake to auto align. So if I try that once more, do a quick shake, you can see it's automatically put this into this grid icon. Now one thing I don't really like is you can see how the widgets don't have a fixed size. So if there's not enough space, it will make the widget sizes smaller. So it doesn't you know, actually tell you it can't fit, try adding it onto a different page, but instead just tries to squish everything in. Not, not as aesthetically pleasing, uh, but it is what it is. On this main page, you can see I don't have the ability to add any widgets, but on the one to the side here, I have access to some commonly used programs and apps. Trying out some of the other buttons on the side here, the first one is the quick launch shortcut slash multitasking. I can tap on that once to go back and forth between some of these uh, apps that I have open, 
and I can tap on it once again to exit out of that interface. The button that's uh, slightly taller here is the lock one that uh, will lock the touchscreen, and it will change the wallpaper as well each time that you unlock and lock it again. I can long hold to unlock it and the phone will vibrate, uh, or I can also tap and hold on the touchscreen display itself to unlock it as well. A quick look at the camera interface and performance. So this is what it looks like. It's actually pretty simple. I can tap once to hide all the information. I can toggle the flash on or off. I can also change things like the exposure, white balance. Uh, there's also electronic image stabilization. The biggest difference compared to modern phones here in 2018 would be that shutter speed is definitely a lot slower. So here are a few sample shots. The first one is captured using the front-facing camera, which is just VGA in quality, uh, but it's decent enough for things like, let's say, Skype or for selfies it does the job and then some other shots here captured using the rear camera it takes a second for the shot to completely snap into focus uh, afterwards I can use pinch to zoom to take a closer look at details for the most part colors are pretty accurate definitely not as saturated as on more current devices uh, with that being said not a bad camera at all considering it's almost a decade old and a few other images here this one is using the flash. It's actually doing a pretty good job of illuminating the subject without overexposing it. And in one other image, uh, you can see it there just snap into focus after thinking for a second. And a quick look at the music playing capabilities. Interesting just because the sound or the speaker is integrated into the earpiece where you answer phone calls. It's a pretty clever design because it minimizes the number of ports they have to build so there isn't a separate speaker on the back or on the side. So the sound uh, comes out loud and clean, and it's also the same design that we see on the new iPhone X, for instance, where they also use a speaker in the earpiece and a second speaker on the bottom for the stereo effect. On here, it's still a mono speaker, but it comes out onto the top here. So pausing the sample there, again, a pretty simple interface. You can see cover art if it's available, including artist information. You can shuffle the songs. And one thing that's impressive about the music player is that there are a lot of equalizers that you can play around with, which actually do work and changes the uh, experience of the sound. Finally, there is a shortcut where you can tap on the top, kind of like a notification shade that pops down, shows your status summary if there's any messages coming in, time and date information, and you can easily toggle on or off things like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth in addition to uh, accessing the music player. So these are quick shortcuts that you can tap and click on. So that's more or less it as far as our hands-on throwback look at the LG Prada 2, again a phone that came out around 10 years ago. And back then it was considered a cutting edge feature phone slash smartphone of sorts because it had Wi-Fi, which was a rare feature for many devices back in the day. It had a capacitive touchscreen in addition to a QWERTY keyboard, as well as a camera that actually produced some pretty decent results for the time, even though shutter speed is now considered to be quite slow by 2018 standards. Regardless, it's uh, interesting to see how far we've come, uh, both in terms of technology, in terms of LG's design, and as well as uh, seeing how the concept of luxury phones or fashion phones has slightly you know, tapered off through the years as the capabilities and functionality have become more and more powerful in regular smartphones, there really isn't a massive need or demand anymore for luxury devices like this, uh, which uh, back in the day did offer more features than a typical phone, but that is absolutely not the case anymore here in 2018. So thanks for watching this video here at OS Reviews. This was a look back at the LG Prada 2.